Breaking news this Thursday night, Donald Trump is indicted. What's next for the first current or former U.S. president to face criminal charges? Calls to overhaul the RCMP, the findings from Nova Scotia's Mass Casualty Commission. There's no question there need to be changes. The force's failures investigating Canada's deadliest shooting rampage. The Vatican denounces the doctrine of discovery. These original papal bulls were all about the theft of our land. What some indigenous leaders say needs to be done next. Out with the new and in with the old. Now they're making everything throw away. Questions about Canada's proposed right to repair rules aimed at reducing waste and saving you money. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Nitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with breaking news out of New York tonight where a grand jury has voted to indict former U.S. President Donald Trump. He's now the first American president, current or former, to face criminal charges. The case is centered around a hush money payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels during Trump's 2016 campaign. Our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco joins us now. Jackson, what can you tell us? Well, me too. This was a surprise to almost everyone, including Trump himself, because in recent days, they thought that the grand jury was actually backing away from any sort of imminent indictment, despite Trump's prediction more than a week ago that he was on the verge of, in fact, being indicted. As of tonight, we don't know what the specific charges are. We don't know what the indictment says. There's still a lot more to unfold here. Uh, at this point, what we do know is what you mentioned, that this relates to that alleged hush money payment case involving adult film stars. Stormy Daniels. And we know that just in the past few days, the grand jury has been continuing its work in New York, hearing from more and more witnesses in the case. Uh, essentially, how this will play out in the next few days now is that we will have the indictment formally announced by prosecutors in New York, at which point Donald Trump will be informed. Arrangements will be made for him to turn himself in in Manhattan. And Nithu, at that point, he will likely be fingerprinted and photographed, arraigned before a judge, and then likely released on bail pending trial. So Jackson, this is what many may consider an unexpected development. As you highlighted, a big question now, where do we go from here? What happens to Trump now? You know, a couple things. First of all, I think everyone's watching to see how the former president is going to react to all of this. He's already put out a statement tonight denouncing the indictment as a witch hunt. Uh, he is saying that essentially this is, uh, you know, politically motivated against him. None of this stops him from running for president. So very curious to see how his campaign unfolds and how much of a circus he may or may not want around the history of being the first former president to be indicted and facing criminal charges. We know you'll be watching the developments closely for us. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. Turning now to news in this country and the heavy criticism of the RCMP over its response to the 2020 shooting rampage in Nova Scotia. The Mass Casualty Commission has handed down its final report into the worst mass shooting in Canadian history. It condemns the RCMP on several levels for a lack of leadership and failure to warn the community of the danger. Over 13 hours, a gunman killed 22 people across Nova Scotia, including a pregnant mother. It's been an emotional day for the families of the victims. There are 130 recommendations in the 3,000-page report. Mike Armstrong is in Truro, Nova Scotia, and has been pouring through the details. The families of the victims pushed and protested for this inquiry. But this final report may have been as much for the politicians as for them. The commissioner, almost right off the top, challenged those with power to listen and lead. Our recommendations call for transformative change. They call for collaboration. They call for leadership. They call for you to champion these recommendations. Some of the main findings of the report deal with what was missed. The perpetrator had a long history of violent and intimidating behavior. There were years of red flags, but no one put them together. His pattern and escalation of violence could have and should have been addressed. As for that first night in port au the commission commends the first officers on the scene, but says there were mistakes after that. There was no scene commander, 911 information wasn't properly passed on, and when witnesses told officers the perpetrator was driving a fully marked RCMP cruiser, police didn't believe them. The inquiry also finds police were focused on the perpetrator, but not enough on alerting and protecting the public. 
When RCMP Communications did put word out, the commission says it understated the threat. The number one mandate of any law enforcement is ensuring that the community is safe. And on that day, the challenge we face, we weren't able to keep that community safe. And for that, I am sorry. The commission also criticizes the RCMP's treatment of Lisa Banfield, the perpetrator's common law spouse. It amounted to what the report calls re-victimization and says she was in no way any sort of a trigger for the event. A single charge of providing the gunman with ammunition was eventually dropped. What happened to Ms. Banfield, the way she was treated in the aftermath of this massacre, which began as an assault against her, is disgraceful. The report makes 130 recommendations, more than half deal with policing. It calls on Ottawa to hold a comprehensive review of the RCMP and to consider restructuring its responsibilities. It calls for the force to recognize a duty of care towards victims of mass casualty events. It says there should be tighter control of police paraphernalia like uniforms, badges and gear. And it calls for new firearms rules, such as lowering the maximum number of bullets in a handgun magazine from 10 to 5 and requiring a license not just to buy, but to possess ammunition. To have this report and know that the families and the public have been heard uh, is a, a fantastic thing. Uh, you know, nothing can be changed, but we gotta, we got to move forward with everything. One of the surprising things today was that the RCMP commissioner hadn't actually reviewed the recommendations, that despite the RCMP having been given an early copy of the report yesterday, he did say he would review them eventually and in fact promised to start a website so the public can follow the force's progress with the recommendations online. Nithu? Mike Armstrong in Truro, Nova Scotia. Thanks, Mike. A major announcement from the Catholic Church today, one that some Indigenous leaders in Canada are welcoming. The Vatican has formally repudiated the so-called Doctrine of Discovery, the colonial-era documents that justified the seizure of Indigenous lands. In a statement, the Vatican asked for pardon for the papal decrees that did not adequately reflect the equal dignity and rights of Indigenous peoples and worked to rationalize immoral acts against them by colonial powers. Indigenous groups have been calling for the doctrine to be rescinded for decades. But as Heather Urex West reports, some leaders say today's statement doesn't go far enough. 500 years ago, three decrees from the Pope set the stage for generations of Indigenous suffering and misery. The loss of land, culture, the horrors of residential school, all grew from the seed of this doctrine of discovery. Which said that when European explorers uh, carrying the flag or the consent of the Pope uh, would encounter non-Christians, uh, they could simply take their lands. 500 years later, the Vatican says that was wrong. Any language, concept, justification for the colonizing powers to have taken Indigenous lands was wrong and should never have been justified. It's a statement that Indigenous groups have been waiting for. When Pope Francis made his penitential pilgrimage to Canada last summer, apologizing for the church's role in the abuses suffered at residential school, there had been disappointment that the doctrine of discovery wasn't addressed by the Pope then. A statement now is welcome, though the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations says it doesn't go far enough. We've asked for a legal uh, you know, revoking of the doctrine. What we have today is a repudiation, which again is a step in the right direction. Uh, it just lacks the, the action needed beyond that. That action, according to Archibald, should include a new decree from the Pope, one that declares Indigenous people have value and worth. We need to get to a place where we are actually seen as having the same human rights as everyone else across Turtle Island, and we're not quite there yet. Because evident in every First Nation community without access to clean water, or the over-representation of Indigenous people in Canada's child welfare system and jails, 500 years later, the scars of that doctrine remain. Heather Urex-West, Global News, Calgary. 
Outside the Vatican, Pope Francis is said to be improving. He's in a Rome hospital after being admitted for a respiratory infection. In the past, the 86-year-old pontiff has indicated he may step down if he's no longer able to fulfill his duties. So his health may be more closely watched than any pope in history. Redmond Shannon reports. The world's media outside the hospital where Pope Francis is being treated for a respiratory infection. There too, a statue of the last pope to die while still in the role, John Paul II. <laughs> News that Francis's health is gradually improving reached visiting worshippers in the Vatican on Thursday. Our faith, we believe that Pope Francis soon we will celebrate with him to the Easter. The busy Easter week begins over the weekend with Palm Sunday. Hospital staff are optimistic Francis can attend, according to Italian media. When the late Pope Benedict resigned 10 years ago, it set a new modern precedent. Francis has hinted he might follow Benedict's lead if he were very ill. But more recently, the 86-year-old suggested he would be reluctant to set it as the new norm. That could elicit a certain uh, I mean, appetite for maneuvers in the Vatican, in the global church. And he's quite right about that. In the past year, a knee injury forced Francis to use a wheelchair. And he recently has had a recurrence of an intestinal issue that previously needed surgery. The decision on just how ill he would need to be to step down rests entirely with Pope Francis himself. The pontiff is due to visit Hungary next month. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. In Tel Aviv, it was a night of protests. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu may have pressed pause on a contentious judicial overhaul plan, but that didn't stop both people on both sides from taking to the streets. Demonstrators gathered outside the U.S. Embassy to praise American President Joe Biden's criticism of the proposal. But hundreds also rallied in support of the changes, destroying property and making veiled threats, even against our own team. All of it showing the deep divide between left and right among Israelis. Crystal Gamansing reports from Tel Aviv. Build as a liberty march for and by those who support judicial reforms. Roughly 1,500 danced and hailed the man they lovingly call Bibi. This is the Likud flag, which is also blue and white. The reason I took it is because the leftists are using now the regular flag. No one in this crowd wants to be mistaken for a leftist, a sign of just how divided Israeli society is right now. This rally was the first since Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was forced to pause his planned legislative changes. We're not going to stay silent for it because we voted and we won this and we are the majority. The energy at this particular rally fluctuated between jovial and frenzied as a man with a Kach party flag was spotted. It's a banned extreme right-wing group in Israel. He was quickly ejected. Then attention turned to a temporary art sculpture. It was set up days ago, a creation noting that elite Israeli fighter pilots said they'd refuse to train if reforms were passed. The display was toppled. People took turns busting it up while others tried to shield them in the act. Cameras were blocked and at least one media crew was escorted away from the area. In my case, a man started shouting Al Jazeera, pointing at me and gesturing for people to move towards me. The group eventually took to the streets, blocking traffic. Police were on hand, but it's unclear if the march was part of the rally or just the direction the crowd decided to go. But there's no confusion over the direction they want the government to take. Don't give up. The next session, they will, will have to get the reform done. Given what we've seen so far this week, it's unclear if, when or how these divisions can be mended. More rallies are planned, including at the homes of members of the Knesset, who the anti-reform side believe could be sympathetic to their cause. Nithu? Crystal Gamansing in Tel Aviv, Israel. Thanks, Crystal. 
Natural health products under scrutiny. Coming up, Ottawa's plan to tighten the rules on things like vitamins and homeopathic medicines. When we think of the word natural in terms of health remedies, many of us believe that must mean the product can't hurt us. But that's not always the case. This week's federal budget includes a proposal to further regulate natural health products in order to protect Canadians. Catherine Ward reports. A lot of people equate the word natural with safe. They feel that if it comes from nature, it couldn't possibly be harmful. And that's absolutely not the case. The federal budget proposes amending the Food and Drug Act to enable regulators to take stronger action when health or safety issues are identified with natural products. Natural health products include vitamins and minerals, herbal remedies and traditional medicines. They're used widely by people and um, we really need to see some protection put in place so that consumers can make better decisions. Ideally, we would have that system in place already, but uh, the legislation was not created at the time to include natural health products. Bari Power works with the Canadian Association of Pharmacists. The legislation he refers to is known as Vanessa's Law, which came into effect in 2014. Provisions include the ability to recall unsafe therapeutic products, impose tougher fines and penalties, as well as mandatory reporting of serious adverse drug reactions and medical device incidents by healthcare institutions. Currently, natural health products, uh, there is no requirement for healthcare professionals or consumers to report side effects that come in. Emergency room physician Dr. Steve Flindel welcomes the move, knowing firsthand what could be at stake. I've had a young epileptic patient well controlled on uh, contemporary medications and uh, was advised to switch to zinc uh, by a um, so-called practitioner. And unfortunately, the uh, the patient went into status epilepticus and wound up dying uh, several days later in an ICU. While this note was included in the budget, there is no new money earmarked for this change and the timeline for implementation is unclear. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. The right to repair. Next, what's behind the federal push for an easier fix to your household items? The federal budget released this week included plans for so-called right to repair rules. They're meant to make it easier and cheaper to fix things like home appliances, electronics and farming equipment instead of having to completely replace them. But as Taria Isri reports, how new rules could be implemented still remains unclear. Yeah. In our disposable culture, and the brush roll and casing was worn out here. Repair shops so like this one are becoming rare. You're all set. John Paravan owns Vac Shack in Ottawa and has fixed countless vacuums over the years. The older stuff is a lot better than newer products that they make because now they're making everything throw away. I like to make sure that I've got good service out of what I bought before. It just doesn't make sense to throw it away. But when it comes to all our appliances and devices, Sometimes it makes more sense to let go. I think we already uh, had an issue with our refrigerator and it was the same thing. Again, we had to buy a new one because to repair it, it was much, at least the same price as a new one. The federal government insists it wants to solve this consumer conundrum with something called the right to repair to help Canadians spend less money and cut down on waste. So this is a 1958 and it's still running. Business owner Sylvie Poirier has seen the life cycle shrink and complications grow, with parts less compatible than before. It's really specific to the unit itself, so that make it, makes it more challenging. Uh, uh, and if they don't have it, well, you got to tell the customer sorry. Eh? But business owners and environmentalists say unless there are tighter regulations, manufacturers won't make products that last for the long haul. Europe and the U.S. are bringing in more regulations, pushing for longer warranties and better access to spare parts as well as information, since complex programming and copyright laws can complicate repair jobs. But accountability will be a challenge. I think enforcement's always a little bit tricky. It may be spot uh, inspections. It may be complaint-driven. So they don't want you to fix them. Parts are very expensive. To get a part like this is... Uh, shouldn't be more than two or three bucks. They want you to buy the whole head for 170. And until there's incentive to be in with the old and out with the new. 
the right to repair may not be an easy fix. Taria Isri, Global News, Ottawa. Next, a British commando reflects on his daring feats as he marks a milestone birthday. James Bond might have only lived twice, but one British commando now living in Ontario has enough stories to fill several lifetimes. Tom Bonham recently turned 100 and is reflecting on his time as part of the 30 AU, a secret Second World War unit. Mike Drolet sat down with the man believed to be the last surviving member of this team. Creep up behind him, throw that between his legs and twist it and pull it. And then fall flat in his face and... It's been 80 years, but Tom Bonham is still a commando. Oh, you told that. That's it. Either you do that or you get killed yourself. The year was 1943 when a young British officer named Ian Fleming pitched an idea. He'd create a top secret commando unit called the 30 AU, which he later used as inspiration for his James Bond spy novels. Bonham was 19 when he volunteered for the new unit. All he was told was that it would be hazardous. Why would you sign up for something that says hazardous duties? You're a teenager looking for adventure. <laughs> it sounds good, okay. <laughs> it was only when they began training that they understood they would be different. Regular soldiers didn't have to know lock picking, safe cracking, or how to infiltrate enemy territory in a submarine. But Ian Fleming didn't envision his James Bonds to be regular at anything. Now here's where Tom's story takes a life-changing turn. Even so, the Germans still offer stiff resistance. He took a bullet to the shoulder during the invasion of Sicily. He woke up in hospital with no ID. He didn't even have his beret. After the war, he moved to Canada, got married, and never saw his buddies in the 30 AU again. Yeah, so there were lots of reunions, but because he'd moved to Canada, um, he just completely lost touch. That is until 2020, when historians Dave Roberts and David O'Keefe found him. And oh, what a shock it was to learn he'd been a victim of friendly fire. So you thought for almost 80 years that a sniper had gotten yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no one ever told me. No one ever told me. I was. So the forgotten commando was now found. And when he turned 100 a few weeks ago, a trio of commandos flew over from the UK to present him with a statue and renew a bond long thought broken. It was just brought it on again. I felt as if those three had been with me 80 years ago, that we'd all been together. That's how I felt and still do. Before leaving, they gave him a beret only a select few can wear. The last of the original Fleming commandos made whole again. Mike Drolet, Global News, Tilsonburg, Ontario. And that is Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Your Canada is the wharf and breakwater in Port Morion, Nova Scotia. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.